Okay, we're back. We're on the floor of SFN 2022, um, and we're joined by um, uh, Dr. Eustace Kebschel, who's an assistant professor of biomedical engineering at Johns Hopson, uh, John Hopkins. Um, Dr. Kebschel, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you on this podcast is we've, we've done a lot of um, discussions of connectomics, usually with like electron microscopy reconstructions of cells, you know, synaptic level uh, organization and that sort of thing. Talked about a lot of the, you know, advantages and pitfalls of that approach, how it's costly, how, you know, it's in information processing intensive and that sort of thing. And, you know, you've been involved in um, pioneering a new direction for connectomics, a new sort of uh, uh, way of achieving a, 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 a good level of understanding of how different brain regions are connected with each other. And um, for me personally, this actually goes back to a presentation I saw at Cosine well over a decade ago from Tony Zader. I was very surprised to hear a talk from him that wasn't an auditory processing related talk. Um, and he brought out this idea of using sequencing to basically figure out the connectome. Um, at what point did you get involved in this project and what was your main interest in, in developing this sort of technique? Uh, so I did my PhD with Tony. Um, came in in like the second-ish wave of people trying to to crack this um, I was attracted to this initially as a as a systems biologist my, my my background was biochemistry and systems biology and you know, came into grad school trying to do you know gene regulatory networks and then Tony gave this talk about how they figured out the connectome by sequencing and all um, and so I figured that would be a good network problem to analyze uh, so turns out we were far from that. <laughs> There's a lot point. of work yes. to be done. Is that basically what you're saying? Yeah. Um, so, you know, part of the way techniques like MapSeq and, and related techniques work is through this concept of barcoding. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about what barcode related mapping is? Like, how, how would I explain this to like my parents if I had to, to basically make a simple version of that? Well, so the problem in, in brain mapping in, in the simplest way, I think, is that for the most part, all the neurons look the same, right? And so if you're trying to figure out what shape they have, that's and where they send the axons to and who they, they connect to, uh, either you image at really high resolution and label all the membranes and really try to reconstruct the, the structure of each neuron, which is what DM is doing. Mm -hmm. um, the alternative is to try to use labels to make individual cells or lots of cells stand out from the background of all the other unlabeled cells. Uh, and people have been doing this by, by imaging, right? make a certain set of neurons fluorescent and then you can see green neurons in the sea of unlabeled cells. Mm -hmm. uh, barcoding is the idea of taking this another step further where um, we use not fluorescent dyes or uh, as labels but uh, random nucleic acid sequences, little tags of ATGC or TTTA, uh, which gives us essentially infinite labels so that we can label every single neuron in the mouse brain with a different tag then trace them around and make them look different using that. So, so basically, the you'll use something like a virus to infect the tissue, and yes. you know each viral particle will introduce a new random sequence uh, of genetic material that gets expressed in that cell or becomes present in that cell, and then you can sort of look where these different barcodes are at the location of your injection, and then you know take samples of tissue from other parts of the brain to see where they've projected to? Is that kind yes, of Yes, exactly. That, that's the idea behind MAPSI, which maps out where the, all these different neurons send their projections to the axons to. And so when you're doing this, like what kind of, you know, you, you mentioned the, the sort of fine scale anatomical resolution that you get with like electron microscopy. Mm -hmm. What is the, the ability to resolve, you know, the projection patterns of, of individual cells using this barcoding technique? So like for the spatial most, resolution. Spatial resolution uh, in the simplest implementation of this method is, is lower. Um, it is defined by, so to, to get out these barcodes, to read out the sequence tags, what we do is we dissect the brain into little pieces, grind them up and sequence each piece. Mm -hmm. And so your spatial resolution is limited by how finely you dissect. Like how dissect. small the chunk exactly. you can take out, basically. Yes. What, what is that size, by the way? In a half a millimeter by like couple hundred microns or okay. something it's so pretty small chunks on the order of like a mouse brain region yeah. or sub-region um, 
that is much coarser than what we usually look at um, by imaging. Um, what makes us feel good about it is that often when we do high resolution imaging, the first step in processing is to collapse uh, projection patterns based on brain regions, right. uh, which are then the size of the chunks that we're taking out. Uh, Tony's lab and, and Chang Chen and, and people like that have been developing in-situ sequencing methods now. So where you don't have to dissect out chunks of tissue anymore to get the barcode readout, but actually do it in the brain uh, slice directly. And so there you can, I think there was a poster here, maybe this afternoon, uh, on actually reconstructing the shape of all the different barcode neurons directly in the brain slice. So what is that? workflow kind of look like when you're trying to establish these sort of maps of connectivity between brain regions? Is it fairly automated? But it, seem, it seems that matching up barcodes across many different cells, across many different brain regions would be like fairly an intense process. But um, can you paint a little bit of a picture of what it takes it, to do that actually, type of mapping? It's um, actually remarkably low tech in, really? in many ways, uh, because we're just relying on this genome sequencing technology that's been around for, I guess, two decades now, um, and it's working really, really well. So all we do is, uh, in MapSeq, we inject our virus. Each virus particle has a different uh, barcode sequence in it, and we you know we've tightened it such that most cells get infected with only one virus particle, and so are therefore uniquely labeled. Um, and then you wait two days for the virus to express and the barcodes to move to the different corners of the cells. And then you take the brain out, you section it, dissect out the brain regions, grind them up and sequence the barcodes. And then by their very nature, right, matching up is, is trivial because you see ATGCT in one corner and the same exact sequence somewhere else and you know they're the same, they're coming from the same cell. I, I have this, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I, I feel like when I heard about really early iterations of trying to make an attempt at this sort of connectomics approach, um, there was some kind of transsynaptic component mm -hmm. to that. Is that still part of the story, or is that was that like a, the the dream that? So it started as that dream. The dream was you know have a barcode in the in one cell, and then it hops across the synapse and meets another barcode in the postsynaptic cell, and then you have a pair of barcodes that tells you about the connectome. Mm -hmm. uh, so that turned out to be difficult. Yeah. Um, in the age when there wasn't single cell RNA sequencing and all the things we rely on now. And so we detoured through this projection mapping of, of MapSeq. Um, actually, this is becoming very popular right now with barcoded rabies um, approaches where you have a transsynaptic virus that carries a barcode across the synapse. And then instead of having you know, pre and post synaptic barcodes being joined, you actually just detect which barcode sequences you have in any given cell. And then if you have two cells with the same barcode in it, you know they share a synaptic connection. Mm -hmm. So this is coming back up. It's not. Um, it's not as much of a a, a pipe it, dream anymore. It's, it's not as much of a pipe dream any, anymore. It's not quite done yet. So there's a number of groups around the country working on this, um, and internationally. But um, they have been quite quite encouraging results. That's cool. So let's let's talk a little bit about like some of the applications of what you can do with yeah. this sort of thing. You said in your talk today that you know part of the idea is to understand the you know the basic wiring of the of the brain, understand the organizational principles, and then see where that kind of goes wrong, either in in maybe in disease states or other pathological states, or maybe this could be beneficial for the purposes of like what you're interested in your lab, uh, comparative anatomy, that sort of thing. What are some of the the interesting results that have stemmed from using things like this or related techniques? Well, we're, we're still uh, very much at the beginning of this idea of comparative connectomics or mm -hmm. comparative connectivity mapping at single cell resolution. Um, the field is old, right? Comparative neuroanatomy. It's mm -hmm. been around for decades. Uh, but people have been really limited in what they could map and what they could trace because usually we had, you know, relatively uh, difficult to work with traces that only gave you bulk resolution. And so in my lab now, we're trying to really take all the sparkling technology, which is fully virus-based and should therefore work in most species, um, and actually make it work <laughs> in those species. Yeah. And so there's a work in progress right now. Um, but and, and are you able to combine this with you know some of the so when you're when you're talking about you know the the functional organization of circuits or the anatomical organization there's a lot of different ways to conceive of cell types and mm -hmm. how they might be talking either like in their genetic profiles mm -hmm. or in their physiological activities is there any way to combine this barcoding approach with those other measures of you know cell functionality basically 
Uh, yes, so um, that's one of the strengths of this barcoding method, actually. I think that it, it allows you to cut across these traditional boundaries relatively easily. Um, in some ways, because barcodes are already mRNAs or, or DNA sequences, um, they are basically in the same modality as the cell cells transcriptome. So with, uh, with collaborators, we've published on um, mapping out the shape and the projections of neurons using MapSeq and then taking out the cell bodies of those same cells and doing single cell RNA sequencing on them. And then because the barcode looks to you know, the sequencer, like any other endogenous mRNA, you get both the barcode identity of every cell, therefore its projection patterns, and all the endogenous transcripts. So we can, can bridge that gap there. Um, that's functional cool. stuff is a bit um, harder, um, but there's a relatively clear path forward now that we have an in situ sequencing readout of the barcode sequences. Because then you have spatial, you, you can look at the brain size, you see where the cells are, you know which barcode they have in them. But if you've previously imaged your cells, say by, by two photon imaging, um, then you can or should be able to establish a correspondence between them. There's sort of like a post hoc like yeah. analysis that compares what you imaged before and then the output yeah, of exactly. the, the so mapping. Yeah, exactly. So you try to register the, the in situ sequencing images with the two photon images that you had before. But it, it's the same cells, right? Yeah, so you should yeah. be able to make that correspondence. That's very cool. Um, so maybe we could talk a little bit about where your lab is heading now. Mm -hmm. So um, I saw, you know, sort of stemming out of some of your post hoc work where you were looking at. Um, you know, evolutionary related questions about uh, how, you know, brain regions differentiate in their, their structure and organization across taxa and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. That's something that you seem to be pushing forward um, nowadays. Can you talk a little bit about um, this project on cerebellar nuclei that, or like yeah. what you've been doing at, for your postdoc work? What, why, why the cerebellar nuclei specifically? <laughs> What's interesting about that, and why is it a nice target for studying questions about brain evolution? Yeah, so the, the basic question we want to answer is how do you add functionality to an existing brain over evolutionary time? Uh, because the, the hope is that if we do understand how the brain becomes more complicated, more and the existing circuit becomes supercharged in, some, in, in functionality, uh, we should be able to reduce down what we're seeing in any given animal to its bare bones and maybe have a better chance of understanding that. Um, and so in my postdoc work, we, well, first wanted to do this at the cell type, at the transcriptomic cell type level, because it's relatively easy to compare across species. And we ended up settling on the cerebral nuclear as a, as a test case. Um, they have a number of very convenient features for this. So they, the cerebellum nuclei are the output structures of the cerebellum. Mm -hmm. um, the cerebellum is present, is an ancient brain structure is present in, in all uh, jawed vertebrates. Um, but it seems to have taken on additional functionality over the course of, of evolution, where it's presumably its ancestral function is balanced or motor related. But in mammals, for example, half of the cerebellum or the, the whole hemisphere is doing non-motor related uh, work, language, and, and the like. And so um, cerebellar cortex looks very similar across all, all of these species. Spokindler cells, granular cells, a very crystalline uh, motif hasn't changed much other than in size. But the cerebellar nuclei have changed in number. Hmm. So in um, what well, we don't, you know, obviously, we, if we don't have cerebellum, we also have no cerebellar nuclei in jawless vertebrates. Um, but in cartilaginous fish, so sharks and amphibians, we have a single cerebellar nucleus per hemisphere. In reptiles and birds, there's two, and in mammals, there's uh, three or four. Hmm. So it's a nice system where you can follow along uh, maybe an expansion of a system of, of, of brain regions in, in number. Um, and the other thing is that they are, that they are easy to identify across species. So often um, in these trying to understand brain uh, brain evolution if you look at a really large brain region with lots of subdivisions it's going to be very hard to know that you're comparing exactly the right subdivision uh, across many multiple different species so you know uh, but if you have very small brain regions that are very clearly defined by a consistent input layer like the potential cells um, then you cut out all that uh, concern of comparing apples to oranges yeah so um, you know I guess what this opens up is lots of questions about what is similar across these different species, like from sharks to frogs to yeah. birds to, to mammals. 
in terms of like the cell types that are there, the, but also anatomically where these mm -hmm. things are lo localized. Um, and so, um, you know, you started your lab, I think, in 2021. Is that right? Yes. Um, so what were some of the challenges in, like, what were some of your first priorities of what to set up? And also, like, coming, like, out of the pandemic era, I assume, like, there's a lot of, like, interesting challenges for, uh, uh, you know, an assistant professor who's just starting his lab. What was that kind of transition from your postdoc to your faculty position? Well, set, setting up a, la a lab is uh, pretty wild. Um, <laughs> it might be like that always, yeah. pandemic or not, right? Um, for all I know. Um, our main focus has been uh, on, on setting the foundation. So we're actually able to do brain mapping in all these different species. Um, so we had a poster here just uh, focusing on the transcriptomics, doing single cell and then spatial transcriptomics in frogs and lungfish, mm -hmm. um, really making sure that all our tools work in whatever animal we want to throw them at. Um, and then on the conic, and that, that seems to be just fine. Uh, on the connectomics end, uh, we're working the main challenge at bringing these barcoding technologies to different species that are mammals or mice specifically is making the viruses work right. um, consistently, not just like some random set of cells that where, you, where you're missing half of right. what's interesting. Or like the promoters aren't like, you know, yeah. effective in one species or another yeah. or something. Yeah, exactly. Like that. So the virus we're using is an RNA virus and it's a mosquito borne, it's an Arbor virus. It actually has a very broad host range. So with collaborators, with, you know, it, it expresses, if it infects a cell, it does express in uh, Xenopus and uh, in, in uh, okay. birds and, you know, all over the place. Mosquitoes, obviously, it's, uh, zebrafish is published. Um, so um, this is a great vehicle for um, doing what we, what we want to do. Um, but not all cells do get infected, not even in mouse. And right. so we have tropism issues to deal with. And so we're doing a lot of uh, pseudotyping work, a lot of uh, receptor overexpressions and, and the like to make sure that we have this battery of viruses that we can uh, apply to any or test out in any circuit that we would like to map. Yeah, it seems like a unique challenge. Like normally you maybe you have like a set of experiments you want to do in sp some specific model organism, but like it seems like in this case, there's a whole range of organisms and some that maybe you haven't even thought of yet that will be like useful for specific types of yeah. questions, evolutionary questions. So having those tools that were developed maybe in a mouse being available for a lungfish is like, there's probably a lot of groundwork that goes into that, I imagine, uh, making that work. Uh, yeah, yes and no. So I think this, it's not that any of these most stranger animals is any harder to infect, right? And we've just done a lot of the work in mouse and all right. our tools are optimized for mice. Right. So what we're trying to do is come up with like this, um, this general set of like, you know, 20 different viruses that all carry the same genomic payload so that we can just test them out and you know, not have to reinvent the wheel for every single uh, system that we're, we're going into. That's great. So, you know, one thing that, um, you know, I think is happening like kind of across the globe is, you know, uh, everybody wants to find people to help wor work with these experiments. And so I, I guess my question for you is, are you on the market for grad students and postdocs right uh, now? Certainly. Um, and what, 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 uh, who would be especially <laughs> encouraged to apply? Or, or what's, what are some of the best ways to reach out to you if, if somebody's interested in uh, studying brain evolution with yeah. you? Yeah, we, we are actively looking for postdocs right now. Um, Anyone who's interested in, in either hardcore like evolutionary work, trying to make these tools work in different species, uh, we're focusing on songbirds right now. Um, Very cool. Should, should reach out. Um, in a parallel track, actually, we are applying the same tools and the same comparative ideas to just looking um, across disease states. With, with there, we're looking at addiction and the long-term brain changes. Um, uh, in, in protracted withdrawal and, and how they lead to relapse. So if anyone is uh, you know interested in, in, in these new tools in, in the addiction field, uh, we're also open to that. That's very cool. So it's a nice mix of sort of, you know, basic uh, evolutionary questions with, um, you know, interesting new genetic techniques yes. behind them and also translational, uh, you know, um, disease-related um, phenomena. Yeah, I think, I think this, in the end, this all ties together, right? Yeah. Because if we understand... I mean, as the scientists and humans, we should probably try to, um, you know, help understand the human condition and f help help 
fix people. Yeah? Right, yeah. Um, but it's always been difficult for me to conceptualize how we are going to understand and fix the human brain if we don't understand how it's any different uh, from the mouse brain. We you know, have all these cures and mice that then don't translate to humans, presumably because the mouse brain isn't the human brain. So if we have an understanding of the evolutionary changes that happen and what conserved pathways are, what you know, very model-specific pathways are, then then we might actually have a better time. So it all ties together somewhat. Yeah, that's actually a really brilliant way to like show the importance of comparative, you know, evolutionary analysis for the purposes of understanding things that are relevant to like the human condition. Yeah. So, um, I, I think that's a, a, a wonderful uh, note to end on. Thank you so much for uh, you. for joining us, and uh, best of luck with all your work. Thank you. This was fun. Yeah. Thank you. We are back on the floor of SFN 2022, and we are joined by Dr. Rachel Airy, who's a assistant professor for the Center of Precision Environmental Health and Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Airy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, and also thanks for getting that mouthful of a title correct Absolutely. on the first try. Yeah, we 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 try our best here, and um, you know, we we reached out to you because I'm fascinated by the stuff that you're working on these days, and um, I think that like. We're also really interested in talking to people who've recently started labs. That's kind of an ongoing theme of a lot of our interviews. So we're, we're curious to hear what it's like to, you know, transition into an assistant professor position and all that stuff. But, you know, to start with, you, broadly speaking, it seems like the major focus of your lab is um, using um, C. elegans as a model organism for understanding the synaptic basis of uh, learning and memory and cognitive decline. Mm -hmm. um, what sort of drew you to that topic initially and, and what is so, so interesting about working in that field? Sure, so ever since I was an undergrad, I actually wanted to be in neuroscience from reading Eric Handel's classic papers. And it was the fact that complex behaviors are really in the end controlled by molecular changes in individual neurons across a brain. And so that to me is, incredibly interesting. But when you start thinking about complex behaviors across a brain, and you start, start thinking about mammalian brains, which is where I started my PhD work, complex behaviors involve many, many regions, many, many neurons. And so if you think about a complex behavior or something and you want to get an instruction guide for it, and so you want to know what you need, where you need it, and when you need something to change across the whole brain, that is incredibly complicated. Mm -hmm. So to get at that, I decided I wanted to sort of take a step back and move towards what's the simplest brain that we can start looking at. And the worm really is the perfect system for, for it. Yeah, so I know from, you know, just being in neuroscience for so long, a lot of the attractive aspects of working in C. elegans, like we know all the neurons, mm -hmm. we, you know, we have a really good description of like the, the connectivity of that yes. system. Um, what I find really interesting about what you're doing, particularly in the realm of cognitive decline, mm -hmm. is combining sort of behavioral aspects of working with worms and then manipulations of, um, like genetic manipulations, yes. basically. So how do you study cognitive decline in C. elegans? Sure. So um, it turns out that I can really understand the worms very well, not just because they have a simple nervous system, but because really what all they care about is food. And so I can really relate to hmm. that. Yeah. <laughs> and so if you think about, especially in the pre-COVID times, we all probably knew which seminars had the best lunches. And maybe I would be very interested in that subject area because mm -hmm. I'd formed a positive association between food and a thing. Journal Club always has pizza. Journal Club always has pizza. If someone has box lunches, mm -hmm. I'm there. Mm -hmm. So worms, because they have such a stereotyped nervous system, we actually know, this is work from Corey Bargman, we know what smells they like what they don't like and what they don't care about. So what we do in our lab is actually pair food, which worms love, with a neutral odor that they don't normally care about. And then we see if we can teach them to learn to like the smell. So just basically by seeing if they prefer an odor by giving them a choice where they crawl on a plate, do they learn to like an odor as a result of training? And so we normally measure how they prefer things before we teach them by just putting worms with food and putting smell on the top of a Petri dish, basically. Mm -hmm. And then we move them afterwards ask them, do you like it? And then what we can really do is take them away from the training conditions and then ask them later, do you still like it? Have you, do you remember it? And it turns out 
that the things that control it molecularly at the broad scale are concerned between humans and worms. And so they're really powerful for that. So a lot of like the same neurotransmitters, a lot of the mm -hmm. same like receptor subtypes yes. and things are, yes. are homologous mm -hmm. between those species. Yes. And so we can study both shorter term memory and long term memory, depending on how we alter the training paradigms. And the, con the molecular components are the same, the big ones. But what we really want to do in our lab is figure out like the full complement of molecules required for each of these complex behaviors. Yeah, and I, I'll ask you a couple of questions about um, some of the projects you presented mm -hmm. here at SFN mm -hmm. in a little bit. I guess one question I have is like, how quickly can they make these associations? Like, Oh, that's really great. And that's a really great question. So we can train them for one hour. So that's really fast. And the really great thing is that I forgot to mention cognitive decline. My apologies. That's okay. But so it turns out that they can learn these associations really quickly. In an hour, worms will form a short-term memory. Um, and normally you have to train them several rounds of training. So teeth, like food and odor several times and you'll get a long-term memory that lasts about 16 hours. And we can study that in adult animals three days after they hatch. So we hmm. can have a population within three days that we want to do this. But what's really cool is that their cognitive aging trajectory, these behaviors, their performance decreases with age and they oh. lose that ability by about day five of adulthood. So from hatch to old non-remembering worm is about eight days. So the speed Interesting. So, so basically, they can you can track how quickly they can make these associations in sort of like the prime time of their you know early days, mm -hmm. you know three to five days or something like that. And over time, their ability to make those associations goes down. So yes. it's sort of a model of inability to make those types of memories. Right. right. Interesting. Exactly. exactly. Very interesting. What is the normal life cycle of of C. elegans? So, are they kind of like? knocking on death's door when cognitive decline is happening? Like no, and that's, that's a really fascinating question. So they, their declines are actually one of the earliest signs of aging in the or organism. So hmm. from hatch to, to death, it's about 17 to 19 days, and they've really lost their ability to learn and remember. Um, between five days for long-term memory, they're completely plummeted out. Short-term memory lasts a little bit longer, and associative learning a little bit longer than that. And if you'll let, indulge me for a moment to talk about evolution just a little. Yeah, yeah. Um, the behavioral declines actually map really well with their reproductive and rates and some other aspects of their biology that makes sense that perhaps learning and memory evolved so that you could remember where to lay eggs for good food for your progeny and then to keep yourself long enough, alive long enough. And so their long-term memory declines almost completely map on their reproductive span. And so it makes sense that you don't need to remember to where you lay eggs if you're not laying eggs. And then they actually stop eating um, about day nine or 10 of adulthood. And so they kind of have a post lifespan. So short-term memory and learning might help you to remember a little bit like, oh, that food was a little good a little bit. Yeah, it's really interesting. So, so it really matches well with the, the niche that they fit and their reproductive lifestyle and that yep. sort of thing. Yes. That's really cool. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, one thing I noticed um, in some of your work is that you're able to sort of use these, you know, fairly straightforward behavioral assays in worms to segregate out aspects of learning and memory kind mm -hmm. of separately. I yes. noticed like sometimes you'll be knocking out a gene and looking at impairments or improvements in learning or knocking out a gene in memory. How do you tease those two things apart? Oh, no, that's a really great question. So, um, this is actually work done in by a previous member of my postdoctoral mentor's lab, Dr. Colleen Murphy. This was Amanda Kaufman, a very talented grad student who never overlapped, but foundation work for mm -hmm. this year. And so it's most, mostly time after training and um, that kind of dictates those time points. But we've done also molecular manipulations to show that different like molecular um, components are necessary for that. So learning happens independently of new transcription or, tr or uh, protein translation, whereas memory, it turns out if you mess with some of those things using chemical perturbations, then they can't do that behavior anymore, but can still learn. And so it's both the uh, time and sort of molecular components that we know are required at those time points. It's how we sort of um, classify those behaviors. Very cool. So in terms of some of the applications of this this paradigm um, and some of the questions like that you that were sort of like priority questions for you to ask when you started up your lab, um, it seems like there's like a, such a wide range of possibilities here. Like one, one area you're looking at what neuropeptides are involved mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in learning and memory and another you're looking at, um, it looked kind of like, a, you know, spatial regulation of uh, of genes like mRNA uh, mm -hmm. binding proteins and that sort of thing. Um, what to you are sort of like the, the, the best questions to be going after first uh, in this area now that you're sort of like up and running as a lab? 
Sure, so both of those projects, and I'm happy to talk a little bit about them, are sort of based off of my postdoctoral work. Um, but for, for me, I think one of the things that's really fascinating is that even though the worm has this incredibly defined nervous system in the connectome, we still don't know the full circuit mm -hmm. for this memory behavior. We know certain molecules that are required in certain neurons, but we haven't yet defined all of the neurons or even non-neuronal cells, they do have glia that are involved in these behaviors. So that's one of the things that we're hoping to get off the ground very soon, and actually this was funded uh, by a new innovator award, is to mm -hmm. find all of the cells across the nervous system that are responding um, to memory training and seem to have altered molecular states. So that's one of the things that we're hoping to do. Um, but as for the peptide work, that kind of came out of a project showing that if you boosted peptide transmission from one neuron in the whole brain of the worm, you can slow their age-related memory loss while not affecting how long they live. So they really have this sort of extended health span to hmm. use a, a, an aging field. Like health flash, span. Health span. Interesting. Um, so in my mind, and I think the aging field's mind, it's sort of something, so how well can you maintain a metric across a lifespan? I don't, if I, when I talk about health span, I don't want to live to be 100 and be bedridden for the last 20 years. I want to live to be 100 and have accidentally gotten hit by a bus that was sprinting to half right. the hour at the wine bar while doing the yeah. New York Times cross, crossword puzzle. That's a really interesting point, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we're trying to figure out what those neuropeptide signals are, but the worm encodes 300 peptides. So that can be complicated. And I think what's really interesting is that we're uncovering a lot of things like both um, pro-memory and sort of memory suppressing peptides. And so it's going to be really interesting to sort of accidentally uncover the complicated network on top of this direct connectome that regulates these behaviors. That's really cool. And so another thing that I found really interesting about um, what you're doing right now is like, there's a lot of gene expression that takes place throughout the neuron, but then there's some of these local compartmentalized mm -hmm. um, translation. Yes. Um, so what have you been finding or what are you interested in in that component like it seems like um there's at least some stuff going presynaptically yeah, yeah yeah no that's a really great question and so i think one of the cool things about neurons is that they're incredibly complicated cells themselves mm -hmm. and so they have very diverse compartments both dendrites and axons this is the neuroscience podcast i probably don't need to tell people this it's good and, to have a refresher and yeah. so it turns out you know this is work that's been done now for a long time by aaron schumann and others that local translation can happen canonically we thought in the dendritic parts of the cells but it turns out that it happens in axons and presynaptic regions as well and so the worms are pretty nice because we can differentially tag those areas and actually dissociate the cells and with fluorescent and then like fluorescently sort them and profile transcriptomes from each of these regions. And so that's really nice to just get a list of things, but why we're using the worm is because it's really easy to just take a list of things that we got that are enriched in synapses, and it's hard to functionally characterize stuff at a high, high scale in, in, in mice. But the student, um, Ashley, whose poster you must be referring mm -hmm. to, she basically looked to see like, okay, You've got this giant list that you made, Rachel, and I need to figure out what to do with it. And that's kind of what we do in the labs. We take a giant list and figure out what to do to do with it. And so she cross-referenced other work in mammalian, specifically some stuff from Eric Klan's lab, and looked to see in terms of mammalian axons, what are mRNAs that are translated in synap presynaptic axonal regions in response to behavior training, but what do the worm versions of those do? and yeah. are, which ones are important for learning and memory. So then we can start to get at the biology. So we sort of take, I'm running on a little bit. We sort of take a reverse approach where we, it's easy to kind of take the sledgehammer for a lot of things and then figure out the, the mechanistic biology afterwards, which is really nice. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of like, you're again, taking advantage of like one of the real nice things about the worm. It has this compressed period of time that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. You can ge generate a bunch of different genetic modifications. Mm -hmm and then sort of go systematically and say, what happens if I knock this out, knock this out, knock this mm -hmm, out, and then mm -hmm. see if there's improvements or impairments in right. these behaviors, exactly, right? Exactly, exactly. And to, to cycle back to the um, synaptic compartment thing, since we are easy, e easily able to manipulate neurons of interest, because not we do know the name of every neuron, and mm -hmm. now we really do have ways to drive expression of genes or markers only in single neurons. So now we can really get at okay, presynaptic compartments across the nervous system is one thing, but what's happening in synaptic compartments 
in one neuron that I care about, that we know is involved in the behavior, and what's happening to mRNA localization and mRNA levels in these compartments in the context of behavior. And then you can even layer on a genetic manipulation so we can find genes, brains, behavior, and omics, and then do functional <laughs> stuff, and we can do it in a week. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's amazing. That's really cool. I mean, one thing that, like, as, as a non-expert, that, like, really popped out to me was when you think about textbook, you know, uh, the molecular biology of synaptic plasticity and things like that, you do think about the spine side of things mm -hmm. and like spine enlargement and shrinking mm -hmm. and LTP and mm -hmm. all this stuff. And it's, it's interesting to me as like somebody who's not so, super in tune with this research that there is stuff going on presynaptically that also is regulating these memories. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, I didn't think about it much before either until seeing a few papers coming out, I think it started in about 2016 where there's some first hints about ribosomes doing things in, I think it was in cannabinoid, LTD, it was a 2016 paper, and then some other stuff from retinal cells as well. And it, the field kind of blew up and I realized, wait, we can really quickly profile all of the mRNAs across the nervous system. Um, but of course we now need to get at higher resolution. Yeah. So, and it's not just worms then, like this no. is stuff with mm -hmm. mammals mm -hmm. and stuff yeah, too. Yeah, so. yes, yes. Um, it has been shown that presynaptic translation happens in response to plasticity inducing stimuli. And it seems that presynapses are different than postsynapses. There are some common elements, which is really interesting to think about how good the brain is at recycling the same components for different parts. Yeah. Um, so it's, I'm really excited to see where it goes. This is for me, what's great about neuro SFN is I can keep learning stuff, you know, even, even in my advanced age, I, I feel like I'm always <laughs> learning something new, even if it's about something that, you know, I thought I, I knew everything about Synap No, I'm not, not that I know everything about synaptic plasticity, but that's really cool that like there's so much new territory to be going into and like new targets mm -hmm. for understanding how these things work. And I will say that I'm much better on the molecular side than on the physiology side. It's been a, it's been a bit since <laughs> I have did anything to do with LTP traces sure, in terms sure. of other than my coursework, but it's yeah. still really fun to think about. So. Um, you know, I guess switching gears a little bit, mm -hmm. like you recently started up your lab 2019, you're yes. a failure. Mm -hmm. um, how's that going? Like, what was it like to start just like immediately before the pandemic hit? Were there any major challenges or anything that you encountered? Sure. So I would say that 2019 was not the best time to start a lab. But, you know, in some ways, there's never the best time to start a lab because it's hard. Even it's hard. Yeah. And honestly, the first thing that I learned is that I don't know anything or I know very little. And it's a really big transition from having to just think about your own science to now also sort of running a small business. Right. Yeah. And um, it's like learning, a startup company. It is yeah. a startup company and learning how to hire people, which is still the most terrifying part of the job for me in some ways, um, because then you're in charge of this person's or you feel like you're in charge of this person's success and yeah. trajectory. Um, and so I started the lab about six months before the pandemic hit. And so we'd just gotten a couple of things going. We made a few new worm strains, tested their behavior to make sure that we could use them for mm -hmm. our experiments. I had my first rotation students in the lab and then we went into lockdown and we had to figure out how to switch from a in-person rotation to virtual rotations. And I've got to say, these are the students who are presenting here right now. Oh, um, cool. Ashley Hayden Monahan and Emily Leptic. I want to give them in verbal plugs. Yeah. Uh, because they're, they're amazing. They're doing great stuff. They're yeah. doing great stuff. And they were so gung ho about it. And we ended up really relying on each other a lot because we were all isolated in our own our own homes. And so we ended up doing a lot of deep thinking about some of these projects and where we could take them and how to sort of shape, shape it as it went. Um, but the real challenge was, is that when we came out of lockdown and social distancing was still in effect and weird things like people not really being allowed to work on weekends, not being able to work after business hours. Um, I had three new lab members, very exciting, but then I had to figure out how to train them. Yeah, yeah. And so it was a lot of growth period and figuring out how to let people go through the growing pains of learning a new system, all of these things while still feeling some of the urgency that everything's taking much longer and much slower. And so it felt like, um, yeah. So that, it, that was really the thing is that I felt like the clock was really ticking. ticking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, like that's actually, we've, we've, we've been with you. We've talked to like another three or four young investigators who all kind of like relay the same thing, like, yeah, challenging times. But like the thing that really comes through is like the resilience of people who are really passionate about what they're doing and like finding ways to make it work. So like, that's really encouraging. And you know, it's one of the nice things about being back, here at SFN, mm -hmm. it's like a place a lot of us come, you know, every year, um, just seeing things 
sort of resembling more or less the, the, the world we're used to in science is, is really nice. So that's been really great for me to see here. Um, I want to also give you an opportunity. Are, are you currently looking for grad students and postdocs and stuff? I, I know you have this uh, amazing new NIH director's uh, new in, uh, innovator award. I imagine that probably comes with a lot of new projects and stuff it, too. It does. So um, we were speaking a little bit beforehand, but everybody's projects are kind of already in place. Mm -hmm. And this was sort of the thing about the new innovator award is that you can sort of write what's the most crazy stuff that you'd like to be doing yeah. and kind of take it to the next level. And getting this really means that our research program has rapidly grown and everybody already has niche pro projects. And um, I don't want to ask the people who are here to take on second or third right. major projects. So we're definitely hiring. Awesome. Uh, and it's kind of on the same theme, um, but sort of with, I guess, bigger ambitious goals and that we really are hoping to think about thinking about behaviors as something that you can write sort of like an instruction guide for as I was kind of talking about at the beginning of the of our conversation and we really want to identify the fullest set of molecules that are required for learning, forming a memory, recalling it later. And we don't just want to know yes or no are they required. We want to know where they're acting, when they're acting, mm -hmm. and then which of those like key components are what is really driving our aging process? Yeah. Um, so all of that's sort of going on. We're trying to build up, you know, take these transcriptomic approaches to the next level again, not just whole nervous system, but single neuron types, single compartments in neuron types. And so really push everything that we've done before and see if we can just get it incredible resolution. And we're also going to be using a lot of cool new um, genetic manipulation techniques so that instead of just mutants or RNAi knockdown, sort of like temporal specificity and spatial specificity. So really to getting rid of a protein during a task or after task only in one neuron and then seeing what happens. Like where is, where is this one gene required? Is it only required in one neuron at one point in time for a memory formation? I think it'll be really fun. That's really cool. Well, um, Dr. Aries, thank you so much for sitting down and talking about your uh, your, your great work with us. Um, uh, thanks for letting people know that you're hiring. And um, uh, I guess the best place to probably look into information on contacting you is probably your website. Um, yes, which I will admit, I still need to do a better job of working on, uh, but I exist on Twitter, so please feel free to DM me or email me. Yeah, and we'll, we'll, maybe we'll put your information in the description wherever we put our podcast Great. this day. I think it's on SoundCloud and all the major distributors, Spotify, et cetera. So hopefully people find you and, yeah. and uh, best of luck to you and all your research. Thank you so much for having me. Thank this you. has been really great. That's great. Here on the floor of SFN 2022, this is our um, our series of interviews with, uh, with neuroscientists sort of catching up uh, in the first in-person SFN in a while. And um, I'm really pleased to, to be uh, joined by my guest, Dr. Ubada Sabag, who's a postdoc in the lab of uh, Dr. Guopeng Feng at the McGovern Institute at, M uh, at uh, MIT. Um, Dr. Sabag, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for the invitation. Um, so I'm gonna start with a quote. Um, day three of SFN, and I have managed <laughs> not to meld into an anxious puddle every time someone tells me, I know you from Twitter, please clap. So, um, uh, and I you. have to say, I'm, I'm really delighted to meet you. I do know you from Twitter because um, you're a prolific tweeter and uh, like uh, a lot of what I know about what you do comes th through Twitter. So um, talk to me a little bit about science Twitter. What kind of what joy do you get from it? How yeah. does it, how how much of a factor in your life is it? Like, I, I just see you as one of these central figures that pops up in my timeline oh my all the time. So, like, what, you know, what's life being a Twitter celebrity in the science world? But it's, uh, I don't know why, but my instinct, whenever somebody, my first instinct when somebody says, "Hey, I know you from Twitter," is to say, "I'm sorry." <laughs> I don't. <laughs> but, um, well, who knows how long science Twitter is going to be around? I, I've, a lot of there seems to be people calling for an exodus uh, I know, in yeah. the recent days. I'm actually I, curious on your opinion of like what's going on there. I think, I think this is overblown. I think, I think Twitter uh, people act like as if Twitter wasn't owned by a billionaire before, and that Twitter <laughs> didn't have Nazis on it before. I think, I think. Um, it's very reminiscent of when people said, oh, if, if so-and-so wins the election, I'm going to move to Canada. Yeah. No, you're not going to move to Canada. You know, like, uh, I don't know. I think people like two-day delivery on <laughs> social justice. Yeah. Uh, and that's not how life works. Um, right. 
Uh, so anyway, I'm I'm not planning to leave Twitter, and uh, if it does like explode, then um, that's one less thing I have to do. Yeah, uh, I'm yes. not gonna try gonna to like, up some time, build possibly. up a new platform or something. That's right. Um, but but okay, I digress. The the question was, you know, how how do I feel about what was the question? How do I, I feel don't even remember Twitter? science Twitter. Yeah, what yeah. like what what is the role of science Twitter in science today? Science Twitter can be. Uh, it's a very good public forum. It's like a town square for a bunch of nerds to talk about, you know, I mean, there's the nitty gritty science that they work on. Um, and there definitely are some very detailed conversations people have, um, which is very cool because also I benefit from it. Um, and then there's conversations about cultural things that we, we, we are all navigating in academia or if it's in, in industry or uh, biotech, uh, Twitter is also very active, and um, I think I think that is a good thing on average. Um, I think there's a lot of times that uh, uh, people's message, people's uh, impression of an issue, let's say, I don't know, mentorship or whatever, might be skewed by just purely who they decide to follow or what tweets end up on their timeline. Um, and if somebody's trying to decide, oh, is like scientific research a good thing for me? Is it the right decision for me to go into it? I think, uh, I think they could, if they had a certain feed, they might think, oh no, science is a, a, a miserable, toxic enterprise, and I should avoid it at all costs. Um, and I think so. So the point, I guess, is that Twitter oftentimes lacks nuance, and so the discussions are good because more voices are heard. But um, there's certain discussions that don't lend themselves to this platform because they need nuanced uh, uh, engagement, and and Twitter just doesn't work this way. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, sometimes I feel personally that I'll hop on there and just sort of like be scrolling to try to find like uh, what's kind of like hot. What are some publications that came out recently? Yeah. What are some cool memes going on? And then I like leave like a radical leftist, and like <laughs> I've been like kind of transformed in like a short period of time. So it's like there's there's good things and like probably not so healthy things that that kind of like emerge um, yeah. emerge for it. some of say. the good things. I mean, so you're. You know, you're one of the, I believe, the founders and board members of Black and Neuro. I believe yeah. that sort of emerged through Twitter. Yeah, basically. so this is what I was just about to say. I think the community aspect of Twitter is probably one of the best things. Yeah. Um, I, I think, uh, so before we get to Black and Neuro, just in general, a lot of people find others that they identify with, um, whether they're scientists or not, but it, it just gives them a way to find groups of people that even if they never meet them in, in real life, they, they feel genuine connection to and support from, and they can uh, have conversations with each other that resonate for their life experiences. That would be different from, let's say, like a, a more majority mainstream uh, experience. Uh, so I think the community aspect is very powerful, and I think this is one of the biggest draws that Twitter has, um, and why people are so fearful that it will collapse. Yeah. Uh, it's not that people don't want to have more free time in their day, it's that they find a lot of value and community in, in, in this platform. Um, Black and Neuro, uh, which is a nonprofit organization now, um, about you know almost two and a half years ago, started off as a um, grassroots project um, where you know uh, uh, there there was uh, multiple events. Of course, in 2020, the whole yeah. year was a dumpster fire. Yeah. But um, you know there were the mur murders of. Uh, uh, George Floyd, and and there was the event uh, in uh, Central Park, uh, uh, where where a black birder was was uh, somebody called the police on on, on a black birder, um, whose name escapes me. I remember Cooper, but I don't remember his first name. But um, so there it was it was a series of very high profile um, injustices against specifically black Americans, and uh, because of how. Because of however Zeitgeist works, this was the time that academia decided, okay, to have a reawakening about its role in perpetuating injustices. Mm -hmm. A lot of because of the uh, event in New York, a lot of uh, black birders got together and decided to organize a virtual event called Black Birders Week, mm -hmm. and uh, it was basically a, 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 a venue for. Uh, birders who happen to be black uh, to share their hobby and their passion for it and what what why what joy they derive from it and just pictures or videos of them doing what makes them happy uh, just to to show that hey you know 
this is a very innocuous activity right. uh, that we just happen to be passionate about. And uh, it resonated a lot because it showcased, you know, joy and specifically black joy. And um, I think, you know, this resonated and a lot of other, you know, niche groups decided to showcase also black excellence and black joy in their disciplines. So there was Black and Astro Week um, that was a bunch of, uh, not astrology, astronomers mm -hmm. um, and astrophysics, uh, uh, astrophysicists who got together and organized uh, a week-long event. And uh, at one point, a graduate student from uh, UC Irvine uh, posted a tweet that said, uh, uh, hey, so when are we going to have Black and Neuro Week? And uh, that was Angeline Dukes, mm -hmm. um, who is now a close friend of mine. And uh, she just posed the question, and then a bunch of people started replying, like, oh, yeah, we should totally do this, blah, blah, blah. And then, uh, you know, I happened to be on a date, actually, when this was happening. So I wasn't on Twitter, but people were tagging me in the thread and uh, uh, saying, like, you know, let, like, let's organize something. And then they were tagging me among other people who they, they thought would be helpful in organizing such an effort. And... Uh, I woke up the next morning and I saw that um, all the notifications and I saw that I was in a Slack um, with about 22 people. And that was the founding team wow. uh, of, 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 of Black and Neuro. So within, within three, three and a half weeks, we fundraised a ton of money to be able to put on programming, high quality programming for, uh, uh, for our week long event, including paying honoraria to every um, speaker that we invited, in, uh, ranging from undergrad to tenured professor and mm -hmm. program officer at the NIH. So that was a long-winded answer to your question, but this is the kind of the, yeah. the birth of uh, Black Neuro. And so like a, flash forward to now, what it's, 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 it remains like a really strong support network and you know, yeah. source of resources for basically helping to propel people in academic careers in neuroscience. Is that absolutely. I think uh, I would like to see it as a permanent fixture in yeah. neuroscience. Um, and that's what we're working towards, um, you know, I think. It's, it's a lot, I mean, SFN just had its first black and neurosocial that um, our organization organized and um, already we're hearing about the, uh, how, how, how much joy that brought people to, to find a community in, the, in this conference where they're already like a you know, very small minority, but um, very highly impactful in, in the field. And so um, in addition to that, we put on regular programming throughout the year, um, a very uh, well attended uh, seminar series uh, we're working on a mentorship program that's about to be released. Um, there's uh, a bunch of like panels and webinars on professional development. We invite the NIH to to uh, talk directly to students about fellowships and how to write competitive applications and so on. So it provides a lot of uh, resources for the empowerment of black scholars in neuroscience. And it also uh, showcases a lot of black talent in, in, in neuroscience. So uh, I only see growth from here and um, and it's you know one of the best teams I've worked with. That's great. Yeah. I, I want to ask a couple more questions about a lot of your advocacy work, but I thought maybe we could back up for a second and talk a little bit about your sort of uh, career trajectory and your your journey in neuroscience. Yeah. So, um, you know, you've been working in the visual system since throughout your graduate work. Um, are you still working on visual circuits? I know you're working on the thala like thalamothalamic circuits and yeah. and corticothalamic circuits and things like that. Are you? Are you still in vision or are you just sort of uh, more generalized, interested in the, the wiring principles of the brain? Right, good question. So first of all, thanks for <laughs> you know, knowing my work. Uh, yeah, so I, my PhD was in vision and uh, that was you know, a blast. Um, I mainly focused on connections between the retina and the thalamus. But in my postdoc, I'm focusing, uh, I'm stepping away from vision temporarily because I, I, I do love sensory systems and um, I, I do want to get back to incorporating this into my work. But um, right now I'm focused more on uh, the broader question of thalamic and subthalamic inhibition. So um, in my postdoc, I'm exploring circuits uh, related to the TRN, which is the thalamic reticular nucleus, um, and the zona inserta, which is an area uh, whose name denotes that we don't know any, what it does. <laughs> Insert uh, here. Inserta, yeah. So, um, so the, the the TRN envelops, of course, like the thalamus is like a it's like a shell around the thalamus of almost 100% uh, uh, GABAergic neurons that um, uh, are involved in many circuits, ranging from uh, sensory to motor to limbic to uh, uh, many others. And uh, 
And so I'm interested in specifically the, the role of the TRN in uh, cognition and, uh, and the role of Zona and Serta in homeostatic behaviors and um, innate instinctive behaviors. So um, in my work right now, uh, I'm still, you know, uh, in my, uh, what, a year and a half now into mm -hmm. my postdoc, I have been engineering, uh, so I've been doing some tool development and then uh, also like tackling the biological questions that interest me. So on the tool development side, uh, I've been engineering uh, AAVs uh, driven by enhancer elements to be cell type specific. And so the goal is that you can inject uh, systemically by retroorbital injection or whatever, um, a, a, an AAV that uh, can cross the blood brain barrier and uh, then infect your region of interest and your cell type of interest um, in a non-invasive way. Um, and uh, that's actually been going pretty great. Um, I'm really excited about it. So it allows us to access circuits that are very hard to target in the thalamus because the thalamus is very tightly packed together and it's many different nuclei that do diverse functions. Um, so part of this is accounting for the diversity of cell types and then building tools to access them. Um, and then uh, I'm also gen generating you know, genetic uh, mouse lines to to study specific subnetworks of the thalamus um, that are involved in cognition. So that's really cool. Yeah, so I'm stepping away from vision, uh, but I definitely have it in the back of my mind. And here at SFN, you know, I hung out with a lot of old colleagues uh, yeah. from from the visual neuroscience world. That's one of the fun things about neuroscience is like everybody's here. You can still stay in touch with the stuff that like you worked on in the past, yeah. all that stuff. I mean, actually, ironically, I think it's really cool that you're working on like sort of unraveling thalamic circuits in general, I think the visual system maybe has done a little bit of disservice to thalamus, at least in the textbook sense, because yeah. it's always been treated at this relay station in LGN that like right. you get, you have a camera in the eye at the retina and then you have cortex that does everything else and the LGN kind of just like relays it. Of course that's not true, right. but it's probably good to sort of step back and look more broadly at the, the functional characteristics of that circuit yeah. outside of vision a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I think, um I think it's the, the very beautiful experiments in the early days that um, were, were kind of mapping the visual responses in the LGN and in the visual cortex. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the granularity of our technology limits our ability to interpret, um, you know, what we find. Um, so, but yes, I agree. It, it kind of led to a field-wide bias uh, in, in how we view the thalamus. But... I think that's shifting. I mean, I think I've seen maybe 20 papers that start off with maybe even more that have in their introduction. The thalamus used to be thought to be just a relay, but you know, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like glia, like people forever have been writing glia were thought to be the glue of the brain in, in, their, <laughs> in the beginning of their papers or, or thought to be dispensable in the brain, but it turns out they're important. I think, you know, um, everyone hopefully is on the same page now. The glia are important and the thalamus is not a relay. Um, but yeah, and actually even the visual system part, you know, um, there's a lot of, uh, there's maybe four or five papers, including from, from my old lab that came out in the last uh, decade uh, that show a lot of convergence and functional combinatorial inputs in the LGN coming from the retina of different visual features. So um, you, there's actually some kind of computation occurring in the LGN that isn't um, purely just relaying yeah. information. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so you're a busy guy. I mean, just today you gave a great uh, talk on a panel on um, the importance of scientific communication, networking, and advocacy. And uh, I, I want to get this right. The title of your talk, The Sky is Blue, Data Doesn't Speak for Itself, and Science is Inseparable from Politics. Yeah. I, I really loved the talk. I thought it was really great. You made a lot of really important points, I think, about how we think about our messaging and you know, the importance of our role as scientists in society, particularly in the realm of advocating for important things. Um, on, the, on the science is inseparable from politics thing, um, can you expand on that idea a little bit? Like, um, what do you see as the role of scientists in the, the political world? Because I think like a lot of times people try to sort of stay out of that yeah. kind of arena. It's a little bit of a hot button kind of thing, but there's, I mean, through your work, especially things like when you're, you're organizing to try to support international students when you know the president of our country is trying to like prevent visas from from international um uh migrants and people yeah. who are going to work in this country what can we do as scientists that that you see is like particularly important um in interfacing with the government specifically yeah. or pushing back on it 
So actually, I also have an article in Scientific American that I wrote that's titled Science is Inseparable from Politics. Um, I think uh, people have this uh, idea, this notion that science is this pure, unbiased, you know, rigorous, whatever, all these like, you know, adjectives for uh, pursuit unbiased. Pursuit of facts. Yeah, yeah, pursuit of facts, noble, you know, uncontaminated, unsullied. You know, it's humans. Humans are trying to push the boundaries of knowledge. Like, it's a very, uh, like, uh, I mean, it's it's a very human exercise. We're just acting on our own innate curiosity, which is beautiful. But it's it's not uh, like this kind of uh, cold, uh, unbiased process. It's we all bring baggage to our work. So I think when I say science is inseparable from politics, I mean that um, in two ways. First way is that societal decisions, especially in the 21st century, need to be evidence-based the policies need to be evidence-based if we're going to not collapse. Mm -hmm. um, and so the evidence comes from science. That's the first thing. So there's science for policy. And then there's the other thing, which is policy for science. Society, politics, dictates who gets to do science, what kind of science is done, when we get to do the science, and even the rationales that we're allowed to uh, use to justify the science that we do. And so all of those are political decisions and uh, you can't separate them from the exercise of science. I think some people also use science to be interchangeable with scientific method. I think those are two different things. Science, mm -hmm. I when I talk about it, I talk about science, the enterprise, the, the process, the activity that we're all doing together. And then there's the scientific method, which is the, you know, you know, coming up with a question, doing the ex designing experiments, collecting the data, interpreting the data, doing statistics, whatever. Um, that, that's a different uh, process, uh, developing hypotheses and, and testing them. Um, but the act of doing science is inherently political. I mean, I mean, <laughs> I mean, we're at SFN. There's so many departments here, right, that are represented, and you'll see PIs that have poster boards that are a whole row, you know. And, um, and there's nothing wrong with that, of course, you know. But the thing is, like, we understand that. There's politics in our institutions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how resources are divvied up in the institutions political. So even if on the small level of a department to a lab, that it's a very political process and hierarchy, how could it not be political on a societal level? Um, so I think, you know, the aversion that we have to acknowledging this concept of science being inherently inseparable from politics, uh, you know, bites us in the ass because... Um, then we're kind of making people hesitant to engage on uh, difficult topics uh, where they are probably one of the best suited people to engage. And, uh, and when they're not engaging, there's a vacuum and uh, somebody else is making decisions. Somebody who doesn't have your expertise or somebody who doesn't have your values um, and you can't do anything about it because you're worried that if I engage, then I'm contaminating science. And you're sort of like potentially by tuning out some of the forces that play a major role in what's accessible and what's like available to you in terms of resources you're doing that at your own peril because i i don't, I don't remember who said on the panel it could have been you but it was like you know if if somebody else isn't going to advocate like yeah. uh it might it, i'm paraphrasing but that was um, me it, it needs to be you basically yeah. Yeah. yeah it has to be you. If, if not you then who if not you then who? yeah that's right yeah because uh, and i i showed in my in my in my talk um data from an annual survey that, that, that um, this organization, Research America, conducts um, that shows very clearly that the public still trusts scientists, even though the, the numbers are slipping a little bit, but the majority of the American public still trusts scientists. Um, and the majority of the American public thinks that it's part of uh, our job to communicate to them our work and its impact. And the majority of the American public, also across political uh, ideologies, uh, believes that we should also not only share our work and its impact with them, but share it with the people they elect. So clearly there's uh, a hunger for us to be out there communicating with them and, and, and influencing, informing policy. But um, I showed another slide that showed that asked the question, can you name a living scientist? And I right. think it was like 22% could. And those 22% were naming people like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Jane Goodall and, and uh, Stephen Hawking, <laughs> who was not alive. And right. uh, Albert Einstein, who's also not alive. And so, like, uh, to me, that says that 80% roughly of people can't name a living scientist, but still want to hear from us and think that we should be out there communicating to them and to policymakers. 
it was a huge chasm still. Yeah, I think the data you presented from that um, that survey was really compelling. One thing that stuck out to me, yeah, like in terms of like other people in society that you have confidence in and trust in, scientists remain up there. It kind of looked like across the board, trust in just people in general was kind of like waning, like yeah. trust in all sources. So I would say in institutions. In institutions. Yeah. So maybe that's a good way to put yeah. it. Yeah. I think uh, the pandemic has caused a uh, a huge uh, kind of shock to the trust that we have in institutions um, uh, in the U.S. I or maybe in the Western world even because I, but I, I mean for me it's not terribly um, ground shaking mm -hmm. because I you know I come from the Middle East we don't trust any institutions <laughs> like um, because it, it all that matters is who's in power and, and do they like you or not um, at least in my country but. I think uh, in the U.S., you know, we've seen political influence on public health messaging and public health decision making, and um, and that leads to a lot of distrust. And of course, misinformation, disinformation plays a big role in this too. Well, I, I feel like I could talk to you for hours, and the 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 talk you gave today was really inspiring. You showed a, a photo of what it's like for doctors and scientists, including yourself, to go do these Hill Days on Capitol Hill and interface with our legislature mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, advocate for everything that's going on in, in science and the importance of science. I uh, even saw a picture of you shaking hands with, you know, with the <laughs> former um, NIH director. And, you know, you know, for somebody out there listening to this who is really interested in that sort of like, you know, ground level advocacy work where you're, you're putting in the time and energy and meeting the right people and you know, having the conversations with the lawmakers to convince them and persuade them that these things are important. It seems like kind of daunting, like going from me sitting on my couch, being wishing I was making an impact on the world and, yeah. and seeing um, Dr. Sabag shaking hands with Francis Collins. It seems like there's an unknown number of steps between point A and point B. So what are some of the steps people can do to start making more of an impact or to sort of like get up and, and try to, you know, yeah. ch help shape the world that they want to be living and working in. I'm so glad you asked this question in the way that you did. Um, because uh, when something is so foreign to you, it seems insurmountable and it seems like you don't, you, you, you don't know how to get to the final point. Um, but actually, I think, um, I think anybody can be an effective advocate. And it, it, what matters is how do you want to do it? So if you're a scientist, let's say a graduate student or a postdoc or whatever, a faculty member, whatever you want, and uh, you want to engage with policymakers uh, on the federal level, uh, that's of course Capitol Hill. Um, so you can do that in your home district by going to their home offices. Their staff are always there and they care more about what their own constituents say than uh, what people who visit their DC offices say. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is, like, there are tools for you to, it's, by the way, very strange because we're talking here at SFN, and I can see people I know walking behind you every once in a while, so sorry. My eyes <laughs> you know, get distracted. it's okay, yeah. But, I, I, I'm doing the same thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, like, um, but there are tools, uh, and uh, professional development tools and training that you can do to do these kinds of things. So, for example, if you're interested in going to the Hill and talking about your work with lawmakers, um, so SFN itself has a program that uh, trainees, early career researchers can apply to, including faculty, um, called the ECPA, Early Career Policy Ambassador. Highly recommend this program. Um, it's a great cohort you, uh, that y y you'll join. And uh, as part of this program, they train you on how to engage in these uh, advocacy discussions with lawmakers. And uh, there's also a Capitol Hill uh, visit, which we call Hill Day. Um, where you go with a bunch of other scientists and they schedule meetings for you with different uh, members of Congress, usually maybe two senators, two, two uh, representatives. And uh, you either get to meet the member themselves or you meet uh, their staff more, more often. But the, the discussions you have are very um, meaningful and impactful and you'll get better at it the more you do it and you'll walk away with a sense of excitement that, like, holy shit, I went, oh, sorry, can we say? Yeah, you can say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. like, holy shit, I, I did something that wasn't presenting a talk in my department. Like, and I went and talked to somebody who does influence directly federal policy. Um, so Hill Day is usually the aim there is not just to share your work, but the aim there is to ask for increased funding for the NIH. Um, and this is not a number that we, we ask for a specific number every year. 
And it's not a number that everybody kind of decides on their own. It's actually a very highly coordinated uh, advocacy effort across a ton of professional societies, uh, Society for Neuroscience, AAAS, uh, ASCB, uh, AACR, the Cancer Society, um, AMA, APA, all these societies come together and strategize, okay, based on how inflation is going and how medical inflation is going uh, and how the trajectory of funding has been over the last decade, we're asking for, say, $2 billion this year. And, uh, and then you go to the Hill and the day before your meetings, you all get together in a ballroom and you all talk about how you're going to ask what you're asking for. And there's usually some speeches um, to kind of motivate you, to hype you up, whatever, you know, for the next day. And uh, those speeches can be from people like me or they can be from members of Congress themselves who are already champions of biomedical research, which, by the way, is Democrats and Republicans. People are usually think that Republican members of Congress don't support NIH funding. Actually, it's a very high percentage of them do. Um, or it could be somebody like Francis Collins. So... On one of the times I gone, uh, Francis Collins gave a talk and said, hey, like, you know, you guys are doing important work. Thanks for advocating for the NIH, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and then that's afterwards, you know, I, I met him and said, you he's know. He's very tall. He's very tall. He's very <laughs> tall. And I happened to know that um, the week before he was in Virginia, which is where I was doing my PhD. And, uh, and he was playing guitar with uh, a, a friend of mine, the institute director. Um, because he's, he's also like a guitarist. Uh, um, and so uh, he, I, I, I had a picture of him that, that I showed him that where he's wearing something like, uh, he was wearing a t-shirt that was a funny joke. I can't remember. Maybe it was like, I have 99 problems, but my guitar ain't one or something. <laughs> like it was some joke about guitar and he was wearing a baseball cap backwards, you know? <laughs> and I was like, hey, I just uh, saw this picture of you, you know, with my, with my, with the Institute director. And he's like, yeah, oh yeah, I was down in Virginia for some fundraising thing. I don't know what, but um, he's a very nice guy, you know, and um, I'm very interested to see who's the next um, NIH director. Right now we have an acting director. Mm -hmm. Anyway, again, I, I feel like I digressed again. But your question was how to get to that point from the couch. Yeah, but and, I think you, you gave some yeah. really great examples, especially the SFN program. Right, ECPA. Program. But I don't want to seem like I'm only plugging SFN stuff. Mm -hmm. So AAAS, American Association for the Advancement of Science, also, which is the biggest society for scientists in the world, also has uh, something called the CASE Workshop, which is another acronym, Catalyzing Advocacy for Science and Engineering. T highly, highly recommend. This is like a maybe three-day thing. I don't know uh, what it looks like now. I did it many years ago. but that you, that you really learn about the nitty gritty details of how the appropriations process happens uh, in, in, in DC and how money is divvied up, how are committees set up, what are subcommittees, ranking chairs, uh, uh, chairs of committees and ranking members of committees and all these things. Um, and it, again, it's like a place where you get a ton of training and build a network of other advocates and people who are passionate about this stuff. And, uh, and then, you know, you can just look up biomedical research advocacy opportunity or something like that, like Google that. And, mm -hmm. Or if you have different professional societies, you know, um, look, look, at, look, at, look into them and see what opportunities they have for you, too. Um, but SFN is a great starting point for sure. That's great. Well, um, Dr. Sabak, thank you so much for all the time uh, you spent to sit down with us and share your, your insights into this world. And um, another uh, plug, uh, everybody who's listening, please go check out um, his personal website. There's a lot of really important research tools and uh, career development and professional development uh, advice. Um, I particularly love the shadow CV that he, <laughs> you posted. And a lot uh, of this do. is something I, yeah. haven't, I hadn't heard of before, but like we, you know, we... Check it out. I'm not gonna. I'm yeah. not gonna go too much into it. But check out um, the, the Shadow CV. It's a really uh, fascinating concept. Um, and thank you so much that. for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. This was a great chat. Yeah. Thank you. Nice talking to you. Thanks for watching today. If you like this video podcast, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool neuroscience.